Geophysics is the study of the Earth by quantitative physical methods. Archaeological geophysics uses non-invasive techniques and methods to effectively see beneath the ground surface and gather information about the archaeological deposits that are present. Under favorable conditions, data collected using geophysical instruments can be used to create maps of archaeological sites that show the locations of buried cultural deposits such as pit features, floors, walls, houses, ditches, and mounds. Various instruments and methods, such as magnetometry, electrical resistivity, and ground-penetrating radar, are commonly used in archaeological geophysics. This video focuses on electromagnetic induction, abbreviated EMI. EMI works by measuring the electrical and magnetic responses of the ground to a magnetic field produced by the instrument. This video will discuss how EMI works in general. For more information on using the Geonix EM38 Mark II instrument, Please see our other videos and the manual that was produced as part of this project. Citations to technical literature can also be found in the manual. Production of this video was supported by a grant from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training of the National Park Service. In the United States, archaeological geophysics is used in service of both research and management goals. The main appeal of geophysical survey is its combination of speed and non-destructiveness. While traditional excavation methods can provide detailed data, they are also time-consuming, expensive, destructive, and often, by necessity, very limited in scope. Geophysical investigations, on the other hand, are non-invasive and, under suitable conditions, can be accomplished relatively quickly and over wide areas. Geophysical investigations have the potential to provide large-scale data about the spatial distribution of archaeological deposits in a fraction of the time and expense of traditional excavation methods without disturbing the site. If acquiring knowledge about the kinds and distributions of deposits at a site is a goal, geophysics may be a good option. It is not always possible to use geophysics effectively on archaeological sites. The success of any particular geophysical method depends on two main factors. Number one, the target must have sufficient electrical or magnetic contrast to be discernible from the surrounding matrix. Number two, the instrument must be able to detect and record that contrast. The first factor is related to the characteristics of the archaeological site. If the electrical or magnetic properties of the targets of interest, such as pit features or house basins, contrast highly with the surrounding sediments, they are likely to be detectable using one or more geophysical methods. A pit feature with a lot of clay in its fill may retain more moisture, for example, than the subsoil that surrounds it, and may therefore be a better electrical conductor. Contrast could also come from the increased magnetic susceptibility of a pit feature with highly organic fill or large quantities of magnetized, firecracked rock, bricks, or pottery. The less contrast there is, the more difficult it is to detect features with geophysical methods. If a pit is filled in with the same sediment that was removed to create it, for example, contrast is likely to be very low. The second factor is related to survey conditions, survey design, and the sensitivity and limitations of the instrument. Areas with rough vegetation, uneven surfaces, or trees can be difficult to survey effectively or efficiently, as many geophysical instruments require consistent motion and or contact with the ground. Survey transects can fail to intersect targets that are narrower than the transect spacing. The resolution of geophysical data generally decreases with depth, so instruments configured to quote-unquote look deeper will see with less clarity. Finally, modern features and objects such as electrical lines and ferrous metal debris, can produce electromagnetic signals strong enough to interfere with or obscure those associated with archaeological features. Soils and other materials in the ground have magnetic and electrical properties that can be measured by geophysical instruments. EMI instruments measure electrical conductivity and magnetic susceptibility. Electrical conductivity is simply a measure of how easily a material or object conducts an electrical current. The electrical conductivity of sediments is strongly influenced by moisture content. Sediments that retain moisture for longer periods of time are more electrically conductive than drier sediments. Sediments are composed of grains of material, such as particles of silt, sand, or clay, and the pore spaces between those particles. Those pore spaces can contain water, which in turn contains dissolved salts. It is the charged ions in these salts, rather than the solid grains of sediment, that are good electrical conductors. Moisture can be present in sediment in two ways. First, moisture can be in pore spaces between particles. This is called free water. Second, moisture can be stuck to individual particles in microscopic films. This is called adsorbed water. 
In coarse-grained sediments, such as sand, the free water in the pore spaces is the main conductor of electricity. Saturated sand is a good conductor of electricity because it can hold a lot of water in the large interconnected pores. As water drains and or evaporates from sand, electrical conductivity will decrease significantly. Without free water to connect the pores, the films of adsorbed water present on the large sand grains are not good conductors of electricity. Dry sand is a poor conductor. In fine grain sediments, such as clay, adsorbed water contributes significantly to electrical conductivity. Because the adsorbed water remains even when the sediment is not visibly wet, clay is likely to be a relatively good conductor of electricity even during dry conditions. The same is true for soils that contain significant amounts of clay. The adsorbed water on interconnected clay particles allows for electricity to be conducted through the sediment even if the pore spaces are not filled with water. This table lists general expectations for the electrical conductivity of various types of sediment. Conductivity is measured in millisiemens per meter, abbreviated MS over M. Note the contribution of clay to conductivity. Soils containing small particles are more conductive than those without small particles, other things being equal. Understanding how the moisture characteristics of soil influence electrical conductivity will make it clear why EMI survey results can be influenced by the weather. Survey of the same area during particularly wet or dry periods can yield very different results, as different parts of the soils in a site vary in how much water they retain. Frozen soil is significantly less conductive than unfrozen soil. The electrical conductivity of soils is also related to temperature, increasing about 2% per degree Celsius. Magnetic susceptibility is the ability of a material to become magnetized in the presence of a magnetic field. Magnetic susceptibility is higher in sediments with more organic matter, which contain more iron oxide and other magnetic compounds, and in sediments that have been heated to high temperatures. Thus, features with organic or burned fill, such as hearths, earth ovens, and burned house basins, are good candidates for identification using magnetic susceptibility. The magnetic susceptibility of sediments is determined largely by the presence of magnetic minerals such as magnetite and maghemite. These are both iron oxides, which are chemical compounds composed of iron and oxygen. They can be produced through a variety of mechanisms, including weathering from rocks, processes associated with soil formation, and burning. These three mechanisms are important for understanding why some sediments are more magnetically susceptible than others. In general, Sustained burning controlled by humans, such as campfires, hearths, etc., will lead to a greater increase in the magnetic susceptibility of soils than natural fires. Sediments with greater magnetic susceptibility will be relatively dark in color. The presence of magnetic iron oxides contributes to brownish and reddish hues, and the presence of humic matter, which may also contain magnetic compounds, will make the soil dark. Topsoils and soils that have been burned or heated will have higher magnetic susceptibility because both heating and pedogenesis cause the formation of magnetic compounds. In archaeological contexts in North America, the kinds of human-modified sediments that are found at pre-contact archaeological sites tend to have higher concentrations of iron oxides than natural sediments, and thus tend to have higher magnetic susceptibilities. In order to understand how EMI measures electrical conductivity and magnetic susceptibility, you need to know something about electromagnetic waves. The magnetic waves emitted by an EMI instrument altered when they interact with electrically conductive or magnetically susceptible materials. Electromagnetic waves are waves of energy that have both an electrical and magnetic component. Radio waves, visible light, and x-rays are all forms of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves can be visualized as waves with distinct electrical and magnetic components flowing at right angles to one another. The electrical and magnetic fields oscillate in phase with one another. A peak in the electrical field coincides with a peak in the magnetic field. Electromagnetic waves can be described by their frequency, wavelength, and energy. The frequency of a wave describes the number of wave crests that pass a fixed point in one second. Sine and cosine are trigonometric functions of angles that are used to model periodic phenomena like waves. The sine and cosine are both ratios of parts of right triangles. The sine is the ratio of the side opposite of an angle to the hypotenuse of the triangle. The cosine is the ratio of the side adjacent to the angle to the hypotenuse of the triangle. Imagine a right triangle inside a circle. The circle has a set of x and y axes superimposed on it, 
with the zero zero point at the center of the circle where angle A is placed. The hypotenuse of the right triangle is formed by a line that extends from the center of the circle. The circle has a radius of 1. The hypotenuse of the right triangle is also 1. And the intersection of the hypotenuse with the edge of the circle has coordinates x and y. When the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is 1, the sine is simply the length of the opposite side, and the cosine is the length of the adjacent side. In that case, the x and y coordinates where the triangle touches the circle will be the cosine and sine, respectively. Now, imagine the hypotenuse of the right triangle is rotating around the center of the circle with the adjacent side on the x-axis. As the hypotenuse rotates, the sine and cosine functions return values between negative 1 and positive 1. When the changing values of sine and cosine are graphed in two dimensions, they create two wave patterns, a sine wave, shown in red in the animation, and a cosine wave, shown in blue. It takes 360 degrees of rotation to produce one wavelength. Notice that the sine and cosine waves have the same frequency and amplitude, but the peaks do not align. The two waves are, quote, out of phase. Notice also that the peak of the cosine wave precedes the peak of the sine wave by exactly a quarter of the wavelength. The peaks on the cosine wave are produced at 90 degrees and 270 degrees on the circle. The peaks on the sine wave are produced at 0 and 180 degrees. The sine and cosine waves are therefore 90 degrees out of phase. The basic principles relating magnetic fields to the induction of electrical currents were discovered in the 1830s. In an 1839 paper, Michael Faraday demonstrated the connection between the motion of a magnet and its electrical effects in a series of simple experiments. The magnetic field produced by a stationary magnet is static. It varies across space but does not change over time. A static magnetic field has no electrical effects. To induce a current in a conductive material, a magnetic field must change. Because a static magnetic field does not produce any electrical effect, it is not useful in an EMI instrument. To induce currents in objects or materials in the ground, EMI instruments use a time-varying magnetic field that is produced by energizing a coil with an alternating current. The alternating current regularly and smoothly changes direction, producing a magnetic field that changes in concert with its flow. A magnetic dipole has two poles, one north pole and one south pole. Lines of magnetic force loop through and around a magnet from south to north. When the magnet is oriented vertically, it is called a vertical dipole. When it is oriented horizontally, it is called a horizontal dipole. The magnetic field used by an EMI instrument is generated by passing an electric current through a coil of wire. The magnetic field extends through the center of the coil. It creates a vertical dipole when the coil is oriented like a donut lying on a flat surface. The orientation of the magnetic field affects the penetration of the field into the ground. Penetration is greater when the dipole is oriented vertically. An EMI instrument uses a transmitter coil to create an electromagnetic field. When the magnetic field generated by an EMI instrument is transmitted through the air rather than the ground or any other material, it is not significantly altered and is picked up by a receiver coil in essentially the same form as it was transmitted. When the field is transmitted through the ground, however, it encounters materials that may affect it in a number of ways before it gets to the receiver coils. It is these effects that form the basis for using EMI instruments to quote-unquote see beneath the ground surface. An EMI instrument like the Geonix EM38 Mark II measures magnetic susceptibility and electrical conductivity simultaneously. Magnetic susceptibility is a dimensionless measure. It is described by the simple ratio of the magnetization produced in a material to the intensity of the magnetic force to which it is subjected. X equals M over H, where X is magnetic susceptibility, M is magnetization, and H is the intensity of the magnetic field. Materials that are less susceptible to becoming magnetized will have lower values of this ratio. Magnetic susceptibility can be positive or negative between negative 1 and 1. An EMI instrument uses electricity to create a magnetic field that is transmitted into the ground. The response of the ground to this field is used to measure magnetic susceptibility. A magnetically susceptible object in the ground becomes polarized and augments the magnetic field generated by the EMI instrument, allowing magnetic susceptibility to be measured.
Because the magnetic susceptibility of the materials in the ground simply strengthens or weakens the transmitted magnetic field, the magnetic susceptibility measurement is said to be the in-phase component derived by the instrument. The alteration of the cosine wave of the magnetic field aligns with the form of the transmitted wave. Electrical conductivity refers to the ease with which a material conducts electricity. Electrical conductivity is measured in millisiemens per meter, ms over m. The magnetic field transmitted into the ground by an EMI instrument is created by passing an alternating current through a coil. An alternating current regularly changes direction between positive and negative. The magnetic field changes in the same way. It is these changes in the magnetic field that cause an electrical current to flow in a conductive material it encounters. The currents created outside the EMI are induced by the primary magnetic field, hence electromagnetic induction. The induced current is called an eddy current because it is circular, like an eddy in a river bend. The induced current creates a secondary magnetic field that is included, along with the primary magnetic field that was transmitted, in the signal received by the receiver. The process of producing a secondary magnetic field through induction is not instantaneous. The secondary magnetic field created by the eddy currents arrives at the receiver after the primary field. Thus, the primary and secondary magnetic fields are, quote, out of phase because they are not synchronized in time. This time lag allows the instrument to calculate what portion of the magnetic signal received by the receiver coil is associated with the conductivity of the ground or the materials in it. The out of phase component of the magnetic field received by the receiver is also called the quadrature, quad phase, or imaginary phase. It is designated as QP in relation to the geonics instrument that we discuss in other videos. For the reasons explained earlier, the amount of phase shift between two waves can be expressed in degrees following the trigonometric sine and cosine functions that relate circles to waves. Quad phase refers to a phase shift where the peak of two waves of the same frequency are one quarter of one wavelength from each other. EMI instruments use mathematics to separate out the signal from the primary magnetic field and the out-of-phase portion of the signal received at the receiver. The lagging wave produced by conductive materials underground isn't necessarily 90 degrees out of phase. The so-called quadrature QP component is simply the result of the mathematical process used to separate the portion of the received signal that is in phase from the portion that is not. Higher values of the quadrature component are produced when the magnetic field emitted by the EMI instrument interacts with more conductive materials in the ground. And that is a very brief explanation of how EMI works. Basically, it all comes down to transmitting a varying magnetic field into the ground and measuring how the ground interacts with that field. Physics and mathematics are used to separate the received signal into electrical and magnetic components. Based on what we know about the causes of variation in the electrical and magnetic properties of sediments and other materials, the data from the instrument can then be interpreted in terms of archaeological deposits hidden beneath the surface. To learn more about the particular EMI instrument that we use, please see the manual that we produced as part of this project and our videos on the parts of the EM38 Mark II, zeroing and nulling the instrument, and preparing and using the instrument for grid survey.